This conference will now be recorded. All right, um, Tino, you or me, welcome everybody. Uh, welcome to the April 1st Campaign Nitrogen Management Consortium meeting. We don't have a really long agenda, but we may have a lot of discussion. Um, we got a couple pretty um, hot topics that going on around around the state as well as locally here in I guess Lower Tampa Bay. So uh, we'll, with that, um, I'm, we're going to do introductions. Uh, Maya, are we going to not do them? I think in the interest of time, um, we're going to skip introductions today because I know folks have um, other commitments. So if you're interested to see who's on the call, there is like an attendees window and you can see all the folks that have logged on today. Okay, well, with that said, um, I am the NMC co-chair for the um, publicly owned treatment work side, and uh, Tino is also on the line with me. He co-chairs with me and represents the industrial side. And David, we'll turn it over to you. Okay, thanks. Well, we'll, we'll dive right in here with the legislative update. Uh, good morning, everyone. Hmm. Uh, calling you from one day after the midweek point of the 2021 legislative session, the very bizarre COVID session that we're experiencing up here. Uh, for those of you who don't track these issues uh, or the legislative process very closely, um, I'll share with you that it has been quite odd. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's one thing to work from home. It's another thing to try to lobby from home. Um, and you know the Florida Senate is completely shut down. Uh, no one is, uh, no one except for senators and staff are allowed in the Florida Senate. Uh, the Florida House is um, a little more accessible, uh, where you can go and actually be escorted from security to an office, and then properly shown the exit when you're done uh, speaking with your uh, with your legislator. So it's um, it's very different. Uh, you know testimony occurring at the Civic Center, the Tallahassee Civic Center, and being zoomed in to meetings. I mean, it is it is quite uh, quite different than, than usual um, here, and I am certainly, uh, if my COVID fatigue was at a peak before this legislative session, it's past the peak at this point. Um, but nevertheless, there's still a lot of work being done over at the legislature, including some uh, some items that I think may be of interest to uh, to you all. I mean, the the overarching issue is what to do with COVID, uh, what to do from a liability standpoint for employers. There is legislation that actually passed and has been promptly signed into law uh, that provides uh, liability protection uh, for for businesses and local governments from getting sued by someone who got COVID. Uh, either uh, you know got sick and died in their family suing or or got sick and have some sort of other uh lasting ailments that so long as in essence everyone you know their their employer was taking the right precautions uh it wasn't some real gross negligence that you know they're not going to be held liable um you know recognizing that this is an unprecedented pandemic and we've all kind of evolved with the process as it's gone along and tried you know I think most people really have tried to do the right thing um, so that has been you know the the primary uh, point of discussion you know that was the, the priority legislation of both chambers as well as um, the uh, the governor uh, you know the other thing of course that they have to do is uh, is pass a budget and you know the the economic fallout from COVID has not been as severe as initially thought. Uh, one thing that really helped is that the federal government uh, dumped $10 billion of flash cash on the uh, Florida legislature to help them plug some holes. And, uh, you know, we're looking at, you know, 95 to $97 billion budget, which is, you know, along the lines of what you would expect, frankly, even uh, without COVID uh, for this year. Uh, in the environmental realm, I think environmental priorities are going to continue to be well funded. Um, TMDL program, alternative water supplies, even Florida Forever, um, the initial budget proposals from the, the chambers are showing ample funding for both those programs. So I, I think that, you know, to the extent the consortium relies on funding to help, uh, you know, support projects that benefit the Bay, 
uh, there's going to be resources that are going to be there for that, uh, including a wastewater grants uh, program uh, that will help with septic sewer and some other items. So certainly when when the dust settles and the, the budget actually passes, uh, you know, the, the initial budget is, you know, you can pay attention to it. It's a good signal of where they generally are, but what really matters is what crosses the finish line, of course. You know, I think there'll be some real opportunities for, um, you know, local projects, local to Tampa Bay, I mean, projects will will have some funding sources to help, help them through. So um, from a policy standpoint in the environmental area, you know, last year with Senate Bill 72 passing, uh, there wasn't a huge appetite for the comprehensive water, water quality legislation this session. There was just so much work to be done uh, that came out of that legislation. And, you know, to that end, you know, the biosolids rulemaking, which I suspect many of you were tracking, uh, came in for a landing at DEP uh, because the ERC was not uh, sufficiently staffed. They didn't have a quorum. There's legislation that was introduced that waives the requirement for the ERC to approve those biosolids rules and then ratifies those biosolids rules. So that has uh, that is now on the House floor and is ready for final passage. Um, in the Senate side, it still has a couple of committee stops, but it looks like the biosolids rules will be in effect uh, probably uh, July 1 of this year, and then there's a staggered implementation date for permits. So again, to the extent that biosolids application has, uh, you know, is, is an activity in in the Bay Area, then that is that is something that will be subject to some new regulations. Um, also, uh, the Central Florida Water Initiative rules uh, look like they may be uh, maybe uh, passed here soon and you know for those of you that have more easterly operations that could be uh, of, of impact to you right now there's a senate bill that that after some initial had a lot of additional policy in it initially but now it's really just a straight ratification has been introduced and, and is moving through the process so you could see those water supply regulatory uh, rules um, going forward uh, another legislation that has been of great discussion over the previous years is the uh, the surface water discharge elimination. I'll put air quotes around the word elimination legislation. This is um, Senate Bill 64 and House Bill 263. The a priority of Senate President Wilton Simpson has been uh, to have a timeline and a plan to eliminate what would be characterized as a non-beneficial surface water discharge of domestic wastewater. And the timeline for doing that is five years, uh, which is obviously very aggressive, but there are some uh, hardship provisions for economic and feasibility, at least in the Senate bill, and some other off-ramps. So, uh, you know, those of you that have a discharge of domestic wastewater into the Bay, um, I, I imagine you're all over that legislation. I think it's going to pass in some form or fashion this year. I mean, anytime a bill like that has such a priority of, a, of a presiding officer, uh, it tends to have good prospects for passage. So I think it's absolutely going to. So I would certainly encourage you to take a close look at that legislation if it impacts you. Um, at another, another bill that is, is probably worth looking at because it could have some 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 level of impact on uh, you know on what you all are doing is is the repeal of the NCORS legislation. So you may recall that the previous Senate president really wanted to extend the Turnpike to the Suncoast Parkway and then extend the Suncoast Parkway up to I-10. Uh, the current Senate president doesn't think that's a great idea and is has done kind of a repeal and replace with uh, you know to deal with some of the identified traffic related issues to look more through bolstering some of the existing state highway system roads that go through rural areas as opposed to you know extending uh, limited access toll roads uh, so that uh, of course could have some some limited impact uh, in, in the bay um, and really let me see if there's anything else that maybe that's that's really it um, from a uh, you know from a scope of bills that you all may be uh, interested in. Uh, I'll pause now, and uh, if anyone wants to discuss any of those items that I very quickly ran through, I'm happy to do so. I'll start off. Uh, just a real quick question about um, 
Senate bill related to reclaim water. Can you elaborate a little bit more on the beneficial and non-beneficial <laughs> uh, descriptors? Yeah, sure. So um, the legislation allows, uh, so if you're, if, if you're a backup discharge to a functioning reuse system, you know, wet weather discharges have an exclusion, Apricot Act uh, discharges have an exclusion. I'm, if I'm talking jargon, I can dive into more details. If you're discharging to achieve uh, the goals of an MFL recovery or prevention strategy, you know, that is, is allowed to continue because that's beneficial. Um, if you are rehydrating a wetland or have some other type of bona fide uh, environmental benefit to your discharge, and that can be you know the proverbial off ramp um, for you. Uh, but otherwise, you know, even if uh, your your discharge is say meeting the requirements of a total maximum daily load or say a reasonable assurance plan. Uh, that is not uh, a beneficial discharge. It's still, the, you know, you would still need to find a use for that reclaimed water that creates some form of either environmental or public water supply benefit. And the burden will be on the discharger uh, by November of this year to uh, come up with a plan for how, it, how are you going to get there? How are you going to take that discharge uh, that you currently have and make it beneficial to meet the goals of the legislation. All right. Well, I've either bored you all to tears or there's no uh, no additional questions. But unless anyone has anything else, I appreciate uh, the opportunity to speak with you all and all the good work that y'all are doing. And, and I've a I have a quick question about the laterals legislation. Is that? Oh, sure. Yeah. Go ahead. Just is it is it moving? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So there is laterals legislation is moving in both the the House and the Senate. Uh, they're very different bills. Uh, so what this legislation is, this is legislation that. Um, it, well, I'll describe it generally and then dive into the where the the differences count in this one. Basically, the goal of the legislation is to empower local governments to address inflow and infiltration issues um, on the customer side of the connection. Um, so it's you know the the private laterals where there is an issue where you know some folks actually drain their roofs into their uh, <laughs> into their cleanout valve. Uh, you know their gutter goes right in there, uh, which causes downstream problems, uh, or else some lines aren't taken care of well. I mean, I've I've been there. I've had the rotor rooter guy and had to get a line replaced because of a, a lovely oak tree that really liked uh, what was coming out of our house. Um, but uh, so there is an issue in some communities where this can make a real difference. And what this legislation does is it empowers local governments to have inspection and rehabilitation programs at a broad level. It ensures they have that uh, authority to address those issues and access property, et cetera. Um, the Senate version is not just a um, uh, not just a uh, uh, you're empowered. It's that you're empowered, and you have to do it this way. You need to take these particular steps. You need to use this particular technology um, in order to do any rehabilitation. And, and frankly, I think it would have the unintended uh, consequence of having local governments not uh adopt these types of programs because it's so prescriptive in how it is the the real rehabilitation would have to occur the house version is is much less so i think there's still probably some little technical areas uh where there could be some improvements um but uh but for the most part it is it is more empowering and less prescriptive and so uh, you know conversations are ongoing uh with the senate and house sponsors on that legislation and you know we'll see where it all shakes out uh, but that's that's it. That may be a lot more than you wanted, or it may be a lot less. I don't know. But that's that's where that legislation is. So thank you for raising that because I had. That's perfect. Guess. Thank you. Anybody else have any questions? I have a question. This is Nan Bennett. <clears throat> Regarding um, the surface water discharge elimination bill, how are they addressing the cost of that bill? So in the that's a good question. So the Senate bill has a opportunity for 
for a utility subject to the legislation to demonstrate economic infeasibility based on hardship to rate payers. I mean, there's more text and verbiage around it, but that's in essence the the uh, the question that you can, if you, when you submit your plan that's required by November of this year, so if you are subject to this, you better get to working on a plan, um, you can make a demonstration that, uh, that the legislation will have that undue economic hardship. And if so, then you can get, in, in essence, an extension. What it does is it kind of puts you on a loop to where each year you need to keep demonstrating economic infeasibility with a goal of doing the most you can to the extent to where it becomes infeasible. So it's not a get out of jail free card. It's a, we can, we can go to whatever, 60%, but wow, if we can't go to 90%, you know, I'm just throwing percentages out there, uh, because at that point, the cost is is too great, and it'd be infeasible for us to be able to achieve that. So that's the way uh, that the legislation is uh, addresses economic feasibility. Um, Jan McLean, I don't know if you want to unmute or I can read your question. She's asking if there's any hope of amendments um, the beneficial to local governments that might occur in the house and be included onto the senate bill yeah so there's so thanks for that and there is an ongoing discussion because representative maggard took the uh the economic and feasibility demonstration opportunity out of the house bill um his concern was that in essence i mean he kind of did one of these hand gestures said everybody's going to claim uh economic and feasibility and uh, you know, the goals of the legislation would be frustrated. Um, you know, I, I disagree, frankly. I, I don't think that everyone was going to claim economic feasibility, but some would. Uh, and, but in his, his point of view was that, look, this isn't really about the dollars and cents. This is about time. And so he is evaluating, though the, the bill is actually up and presently in a committee, uh, he's evaluating, um, an extended time frame for compliance because he would rather give folks the time they need to get it done and address you know economic impacts and technical feasibility that way rather than have this economic and feasibility demonstration so in essence just extend it out say to 10 years um, now an amendment has not been filed to that end to the house bill but that is the approach that that he is evaluating he thinks is preferable of course this is legislation that's very important to the senate to the senate president um, I know that the Senate bill sponsor, uh, Senator Albritton, that this economic and feasibility opportunity is important to him. Uh, so like many things in the legislative process, it will, uh, you know, the House may stake out one position, the Senate will stake out a different one, and then they'll hash it out and we'll end up with, you know, one, the other, a very, you know, some sort of blended, uh, blend of the two, or maybe, Maybe neither. <laughs> you know, you, it always just depends. Uh, and anytime you have uh, leadership involved, uh, you know, things get above everyone's pay grade pretty quickly because it's really there's a couple of deciders on this, and that's it. So that's that's where that stands. Um, Vivian asked, "Is there any DPR news, or did she miss that?" Uh, direct potable reuse is that uh, you said DPR, right? Not DBPR. Okay, yeah, I didn't know if you're talking about professional regulation, but. Um, yeah, I mean that that rulemaking is ongoing at, on the uh, on the the regulatory front with DEP. Uh, they've, uh, you know, at, initially they were going to try to push some rules through and have them ready to ratify this legislative session. Uh, I think with the feedback that they got from their initial draft rules, they realized that that was not going to happen. That this is really complex stuff, um, and so they've received uh, voluminous comments uh, on their draft rules. Uh, they're working on redrafting their rules, uh, and you know, it's it's that delicate balance of how do you, you know, this is potable reuse is. Uh, you know, in a, an important tool in the toolbox. It is going to be part of the solution to some of the water supply challenges in, in the state. So it needs to be an economically viable option. Uh, it, you also need to make sure that you're protecting the public health, the environment through the regulatory framework and making sure that you're not pushing the um, the regulatory requirements to the extent that it that you reach economic infeasibility or sweep up uh, you know, existing practices that have been going on for years and that are safe 
uh, you know, are, you know, there's not any indication that there's a public health or environmental uh, negative impact. Uh, you know, it's it's striking that balance, and there's a lot of details that count on this, and this is something new. And of course, there's also kind of the public yuck factor uh, that has to to be addressed as well. And there needs to be buy-in that you know, potable reuse uh, is something that is a, a you know that we've essentially been engaged in for years. <laughs> Just it's been under a different name, uh, you know discharge to surface waters and a withdrawal point downstream, yeah, that's potable reuse. And this is just a different, you know, engineered solution to ensure that it's it's safe and protective uh, for the public health and the environment. So, you know, I think that rulemaking is going to have a few more months left uh, in it before they have a redraft, before they have a proposed rule, because this is complicated stuff. But I do think they're going to plan on having it ready to ratify in the January 2021, 2022, excuse me, session. So that was a mouthful and again, probably more soapboxing than you wanted, but that's where it stands. And uh, maybe you could speak a little, this group's also interested in the whole concept of SSO issues as Maya's question alluded to with the uh, lateral legislation, but we've also got rulemaking on the asset management side that this group would probably be interested in, David. Yeah, yeah, so the asset management rulemaking, I'd say that it's, um, you know, if if it was a game of Mario Kart, it was the it'd be the one that's operated by my son instead of me, and crossing the finish line much sooner. Um, it's it's in pretty good shape. They've gotten a lot of feedback and have a redraft of their rules that, frankly, I think look pretty good uh, as far as you know how there's going to be direction on how utilities manage their their collection system to ensure that there's not the inflow and infiltration that causes sanitary sewer overflows uh, that there's you know as much hurricane uh, emergency uh, preparedness for lift stations and electric power outages as you know is is feasible uh, so those rules are uh, you know they're available on DEP's website I think they look pretty good there's still some issues that they're grappling with uh, you know, if we really want to dive into the weeds, um, but it's, you know, it's it's ahead of the potable reuse rules, and I think should be ready. You know, I would think probably in the next couple of months to have a proposed rule for adoption. And will it require ratification by the legislature? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So another one we won't be having to implement until next year, guys. Right. So frankly, I think most utilities, you look at the, the rule, you know, this is what this does in essence for those of you that are that are not as engaged in this, it kind of standardizes best practices and puts them in a regulatory framework. I mean, that's that's what it's intended to do is to bring those utilities that that maybe not have a, maybe don't have as robust of a program up to the level of those that that are already doing many of these things and formalizes it and frankly gets DEP buy-in and in, in, in the pro the local programs. Dan, did that answer your question about when the first annual report would be due? No, I was looking for a year that we think that. <laughs> yeah, well, well it, I gave you a lot of words, but not a direct answer. I guess I'm a <laughs> right. Um, yeah, uh, I mean, it'll be it'll be next year at the earliest. Uh, you know, I think the effective date and the implementation time frames is still a point of discussion. Uh, that that DEPs, you know, they're trying to figure out, they want to make sure that people are doing this, but they want to give them enough time to ramp up. Uh, so I would say at least uh, July 1, 2022 would probably be about the earliest and maybe 2023 uh, before uh, these requirements come into play. And, and all the questions about how that gets folded into your operating permit, uh, you know, that's, those discussions are ongoing, but it's it's not going to be tomorrow anyway. You've got some time. Yep. Yeah, yeah, Diana, you've got, I believe you've got to collect data for a year. Go ahead. I, I'm, I'm just saying you've got to be collecting the data for a year. The report is just the summary. It, it's not the beginning. Well, yeah, there's two parts. There's the plan and then there's the report of the implementation of the plan. Um, and so, you know, that's the, uh, those are the two pieces. So, yeah, it's, uh, you know, I, and I think some of those details, I mean, frankly, that's, 
and I would love to get more feedback on how, from an implementation standpoint. I mean, from those that run utilities, that if if looking at the rule, if you're looking at it and saying, you know, there's some cart before the horse issue or some need for, uh, you know, for further allowance uh, for a ramp up, um, that would be really helpful. You know, let you know represent the FWA Utility Council, which is the state association of domestic wastewater utilities. You know, let me know. Let Jeff know. Uh, he's on the board, um, so that we can make sure that in the input provided to the the rule to DP on these rules that there's a realistic implementation time frame and it's it's going to be implementable from the local utility perspective. Right. And so, man, just so you know, in the most recent version I saw, the reporting period is a calendar year, but you don't have to report that data until June 30th of the following year, which is, I believe, DEP's fiscal or the state's fiscal year, right? So you've got six months to report. So I think, you know, to David's point, you're going to have some time to put your plan in place. And then, like you were saying, you'll be able to collect that data for reporting once that plan has been put in place and accepted. And just to give a shameless plug on the use util, the FWIA Utility Council, um, we spent a whole lot of time on this outfall. I mean, I mean the reclaimed water bill last year, the outfall, aka the outfall elimination bill last year, and we uh, hired a consultant to come up with a cost estimate. I believe the cost estimate for elimination of the outfalls across the state was in the order of uh, $25 billion, David. Is that somewhere in the ballpark? So this, there is a lot of money on the table here. Um, so we'll see, and uh, clearly that all trickles down to our rate payers. Um, so that that's still out there. It, it you know, like uh, I think Maggard was the one who wasn't as concerned about that side of it, and more concerned about um, just moving this forward. But uh, that's definitely out floating around out there. It's a well put together document anybody's interested. Hey David, this is Dave, this is Dave Porter. Hey Dave, how are you doing? Good. Is there any discussion um, in the legislature at all about changing or adjusting the date for the report from November 1st of this year to a later date? Uh, yeah, I, you know, I've, I've made that request um, and it was, uh, rejected <laughs> to, to push it back. I mean, just to be very blunt that uh, um, on the Senate side, you know, and, and Senator Albritton has, has really pushed, and frankly, he's fought hard to keep that uh, the economic and feasibility opportunity in the legislation. And there was just not a re receptivity to pushing the plan submission timeframe out. I will say that on the House side, that Representative Maggard said, it doesn't see much significance in the submission of a plan. He would rather have a time frame that he would feel is more realistic um, and then have a interim report. So like five years out, how far along are you? Uh, that an actual submission and approval of a plan he doesn't see as having a whole lot of benefit. Um, so, you know, again, he hasn't amended his legislation to address these items, but that's where his head is at. Um, well, hopefully so, because six months is not much time. Yes, and you know, and I'll just I'll share that when that comment was was provided, um, the feedback was uh, from President Simpson. Um, you all have known I was I was interested in this for many years. You've known this is coming. I I filed a bill last year, or had a you know, there's a bill last year on this. If you're not planning for this event or haven't been planning for this eventuality, that's on you. And again, that's not me talking, so don't don't. No, I know. I mean, that's, 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 that's uh, you're talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars of your ratepayers' money, and most people don't go of dollars. Yeah. yeah, but I'm talking about just for the plan. I mean, most people aren't going to go throw away a couple, two, three hundred thousand dollars on a whim of a of a senator that couldn't pass the bill for two years. Well, okay, let's hope they do something because I think a lot of people are not going to be able to meet that deadline. Or if they do, it'll be just swag and that best. 
Well, it's it's allowed to be a conceptual plan. Was the uh, that was where the <laughs> and seriously that was the amendment that was made to try to provide some level of flexibility to where it doesn't have to have detailed engineering specifications. It can be conceptual. And again, I'm not I'm not saying that's the right outcome. I'm just telling you that's the outcome and that's the rationale for the outcome. Um, okay. Thank you, David. Sure. Dan's got a question about if whether or not there's any discussion to linking the direct potable reuse rulemaking to timeframes and legislation regarding surface water discharge. Would that make sense? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I frankly think that to the extent there's a desire to inject a lot of policy uh, kind of considerations in this and linking to the potable reuse legislation, uh, which we actually, I mean, in the legislation last year there was a, a stronger linkage with some allowance um i i think that that ship has sailed right david doesn't one of them though allow for a, a longer timeline to implement if you're doing dpr one <laughs> isn't there two extra years in one of them or is that yeah nothing? i i think it's something i mean it's some nominal additional amount of time like and i can remember if, it's, if a year or two years yeah but it's not tied to DEP's rulemaking and all that. Right. All right, I see the questions have slowed down, so get out while you can. <laughs> Hi, David. We'll try to go get some sleep. I'll talk to you probably tomorrow, I think. <laughs> we really appreciate yeah. you filling us in, keeping us in the loop on all this stuff. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Appreciate the work y'all do. Take care. All right, well, um, I see Rob's got his camera on and he's going to give us an update on HRK and the tiny point. It, whatever it is, I don't even know what's been going on. Can you on guys hear me? <laughs> Welcome, Rob. Me neither. Um, can you guys hear me okay? Yep. Yeah. Thank you. you can, okay. Um, uh, I apologize if my voice goes. I've been actually picked up a call this week during the middle of this stuff so um <clears throat> i haven't had a voice for a couple of days um first off you know again i'm going to give you my perspective having been you know working at, around that facility for the last 33 years i'm very very familiar with the operations and the closures and everything else um and uh, uh jeff barreth who's the manager at the hrk facility uh, former Piney Point site. Uh, first, since his regrets that he can't be with you to give you the update himself personally, and uh, also, also really wants to express his deep concern and and apologies for having, you know, this happen now. I mean, he's worked, and his small group have worked, you know, their tails off trying to to manage a site, and uh, this is the last thing that he wanted to happen. So. Um, with that said, um, I was just going to give you, uh, again, uh, my perspective over the last week, what's happened. Um, I see Julie's online too. If she needs to bring, you know, bring in some DEP perspective, that's fine because it's really, it's a DEP, HRK issue. Manatee County just happens to sit in our backyard uh, and we've been dealing with it for, you know, like I said, since the 60s. Um, let's go just i don't have any slides to show you right now but just just as a general uh, perspective uh there are two large ponds on site uh right now that contain uh processed water uh the new north north gypsum stack pond and the south gypsum stack pond uh what's of interest is the south gyps pond which is about 77 acres and currently contained or did contain about 480 million gallons of processed water um the north pond a little bit smaller um the north pond is where they are doing their only treatment which is a spray irrigation evaporation system in the north pond and that's been primarily there you go. Primarily a freshwater pond. Um, here we go. 
the, the North Pond and the South Pond. Uh, the South Pond back in, and if you recall, I mean, the DEP had oversight of that facility around 2001 when those uh, closure was started and and, and uh, liners were, were placed in these ponds. Um, was never completed really. So we ended up with these with these two um, processed water ponds uh, currently. The, like I said, the North Pond's primarily freshwater uh, and uh, HRK just recently negotiated with Manatee County to send about 50,000 gallons per day to our um, wastewater treatment plant for additional processing to help them control the volume in that North Pond. The South Pond was back in 2000, 10, 11, um, they attempted to um, uh, basically backfill that pond with solid material from a dredging project at this birth 12 right here, uh, project from Port Manatee. They pumped slurry up into that pond and uh, returned water back into to the port. Um, hence, that South Pond is high chlorides, uh, which is unavailable for our uh, wastewater treatment plant to process. Now, um, again, if you remember in 2011, um, there was a breach, basically that uh, uh, solid material ruptured the liner, and then there was a breach in 2011 that we all experienced and, and uh, participated in. And, uh, finally got it sealed and stabilized. But uh, over the last few months, uh, HRK has reached out to Manatee County and, 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 and the department and basically has kind of sent the silent alarm that you know they're reaching like 80% capacity for both of those ponds, uh, that we really need to look for a long-term long closure plan. Um, and uh, Manatee County's uh, legislative uh, platform this year is, was to prioritize that facility and uh, ask the legislature for some assistance to help uh, deal with the process water, to eliminate the process water so these these cells could be backfilled and, and finally closed. So back to last week, about the middle of February, around the 15th. Again, they're measuring the, the elevation in that pond daily. Uh, samples are taken in the, in the there's a um, uh, collection dip ditch all the way around the, the ponds uh, that are also lined that, that uh, collect the seepage water. Um, started noticing some um, uh, more than usual um, evacuation of the South Pond. Uh, couldn't, you know, more than what uh, just evaporation would uh, would show. And uh, so, I don't even know what day it is. Was it Thursday? Uh, probably just before about a week ago, um, they started seeing again. Uh, some some water in the in the ditch system that looked to be kind of remnants of old process water back in the early 2000s and they can do that by the chemistry as far as the chlorides and and ammonia and so forth so that was not you know they started sending up red flags that there's there there was an issue um, this started speeding up and basically what is happening now is uh, the last the last uh, 20, uh, 2011 uh, breach was up in this corner this is where they were this is the area that they were filling with the uh, I don't know if you guys can see my this south west corners where they were filling with back filling with the uh, uh, dredge material um, that breach happened there and everything headed south and then went out the um, uh, 003 outfall, which ended up in the Piney Point ditch, um, and into I mean, the, excuse me, the um, uh, well, where'd you go? Here we go. Ended up into uh, Bishop Harbor ditch, followed south right. 
all the way down into Bishop Harbor. Um, and everybody under, knows what happened to, you know, Bishop Harbor at that time. Um, this time, it's more, uh, it, it appears, and again, this is our perception and, and uh, you know, we will, we will make, or HRK will make a determination as uh, time goes on, but it appears that now the, the water is moving north underneath the collection system now, and um, they've had to uh, release, a, you know, some of the um, tow ditch water into um, Piney Point Creek going north, very small volumes going north um, uh, that started around Monday. Um, again, uh, things started happening very quickly towards the end of last week uh, to the point where uh, HRK finally requested uh, a, an emergency order from uh, DEP Sunday um, that was issued on Monday. And uh, again, it picked up that north, that north um, release uh, to Piney Point Creek. Um, again, very minor, about 100, um, 100 gallons per minute. Uh, while they prepa prepared the site to do the large release into basically Berth 12 into Manatee Basin. Um, again, they were, they, the infrastructure was still in place from the dredging project. So the pro thought process was to use the, the um, return water system. Basically, it's two, I don't know if you can zoom into that, Ed. There are two siphons in the South Pond, on east and the west siphons. You can probably just barely, yeah, barely see them right there. Um, and again, it's all gravity fed. Um, they prepared those lines and again, they, they've, they're 10 years old, that infrastructure, it hasn't been used in nine years. So it was a scramble to see whether all the, the flanges and valves and gaskets and everything were, were, were in, in good enough shape to, you know, to handle um, a, a release. So um, on Monday, yes, Monday, um, our staff, uh, you preparing for this, um, our, our our laboratory folks and our field crew uh, went out and started monitoring before before the releases. Uh, we have numerous uh, sites that we do ambient monitoring in in Tampa Bay. Anyway, uh, we picked up those sites and additional sites around uh, Port Manatee, um, also Bishop Harbor. We didn't we didn't know whether uh, something would happen that it would. Uh, go through outfall 03, so we're, we're monitoring that as well. So we did this <clears throat> in preparation for release on, you know, uh, possibly on Tuesday. Uh, after everything was prepared, um, Tuesday afternoon, about four o'clock, the east um, uh, siphon was primed, and um, the release started about four o'clock on Tuesday afternoon. Each of those siphons is capable of discharging about 11,000 gallons per minute. Um, everything within that part of the infrastructure from the plant to Port Manatee uh, seemed to be intact. No leaks were observed. Um, and I, I, I still haven't heard of any anything, any problem there. However, when it comes to uh see the let's see where Ed, where the custom right there this the outfall is comes into an open ditch just um into the port property and that open ditch right along dock street that open ditch there you go um back it back up a little bit to the east A little bit farther. Right there. Yeah, right. Right about yeah. Right right about there, the um the discharge 
goes into the open ditch. Um, once we got down there to look at the open ditch into the, it was clogged with old, you know, dead uh, vegetation, a lot of cattails, a lot of muck in there. Um, and we did observe that it was backing up into the major stormwater pond for, I think, farther north, the stormwater pond uh, at the um, ports administrative facility right here, uh, right to your right of your screen. Um, so they haven't increased the, the discharge. Um, we got the, the county public works staff in there yesterday morning um, to help the port clean out that ditch and they're still doing that today. Um, so uh, I, I don't know, I haven't talked to anybody this morning. I don't know whether there's the goal to increase the the discharge um, in the next few days or not, or until this is cleaned up. Um, at the same time, our staff was out there. We're, we're, we've set up a monitoring plan and we've reached out to, of course, the, the department and, and other you know, stakeholder agencies, uh, Hillsborough County, EPC, and so forth, to in the SRA program to start now looking at coordinating coordinating these monitoring exercises. Uh, we're committed to be out there at least twice a week um, until the discharge is um, complete, and then, of course, beyond. Rob, um, Chris, Chris A wants to know if you're monitoring water quality only, or are you also including seagrass, habitats, other things? Uh, that we're, we're doing water quality only right now. Again, trying to make sure that we can pick up the signature of this material. We do, you know, we, of course, I know the SRA programs reached out to FWC and all the other, and because there is a real concern about the biology out there right now. Um, and, uh, you know, we're 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 just we're we're just struggling to to uh, <laughs> to chase this thing down. You know, from uh, Piney Point Creek, you know, all the way down to to Bishop's Harbor and and, and south. Um, but again, hopefully, we can work together and um, uh, you know coordinate efforts and and you know share resources to be able to to, to look at this thing long term. Um, again, I think. As of uh, there, I was there yesterday at noon collecting some other samples, and by noon yesterday, I believe they had already released about 1.6 million gallons, approximately. Um, again, all of this stuff is subject to change and verification, um, but and, and again, uh, I don't know what the plan is long long term. It, the worst, you know, the, the the, the, the idea is to discharge the least amount possible until they can find where the breach is and, and, and get it corrected. Um, but then my concern is what's going to happen with the rest of that process water, um, whether the department will allow them to continue to use that cell because we're heading into the rainy season and that no north cell is full. Also, the north cell is now where the, they've captured, you know, some from, some from the tow drain uh, from this pond and sent it back up into that to that north pond, which now is probably unsuitable for Manatee County to process through our wastewater treatment plant. So, um, not a whole lot of good news. Um, uh, you know, I, I do, you know, having known this site for, for so long and the conditions that were out there, they were deteriorating rapidly. Um, and so, uh, you know, the, the process of, of the emergency order was to prevent a catastrophic event, uh, which was likely and, and, and is still, you know, possible because the facility was very unstable. Um, uh, with that, I mean, like I said, hopefully we'll, you know, we'll continue on and and uh, we can coordinate with uh, all the stakeholders uh, 
and and monitor this and see what happens. But uh, hopefully they find where the where the where the um, breach is soon, um, and uh, we'll go from there. I just wanted to open up for questions. If I can answer, if not, we'll we'll find it. The question about whether or not there's any signal in the water quality as of yet. Um, we should have um, we should have some information this afternoon. I mean, my staff are the field staff and the <laughs> and the lab staff, so they're they're splitting time here. We should have, we should have have some you know solid data from the first two events uh, by tomorrow at the latest. And I think you know my efforts of reaching out to various folks that are probably on this call is to you know there has been a leveled response before for events like this and understanding sort of baseline conditions, I think is important. And we're trying to assimilate that information right now, uh, working with all the stakeholders in the region and, and the monitoring agencies to understand, you know, conditions prior to the, the actual discharge event. Um, if this is going to be a prolonged event, I think it's important um, to have that information set up up front and as quickly as possible. So we're, we're trying to work with, with everybody on that front and help out and assist as much as possible. Yeah, I believe both EPC and our, you know, Manatee County were out there doing our ambient monitoring just a week or so prior to the to the event. So, uh, and then of course we have a long term term record. Uh, so, yeah, we've got a lot of baseline information. And also, just want to mention I, I have reached out to USF's College of Marine Science, and they're actively uh, running some simulations to potentially track the plume based on those discharge amounts. I think they're gonna potentially simulate both the 11,000 gallons per minute rate as well as a 22,000 gallon per minute rate. Um, so if that assists the monitoring agencies identifying where a potential plume might might manifest towards that, that might be useful information that comes to head here in the next couple of weeks too. Hey, Rob, Jeff, I, had, I, had a, Rob I had a quick question. Did, did you, uh, I may have missed it, but did you say that uh, to date there were about 1.7 million gallons released thus far? Did I hear that right? I think that's what I saw yesterday morning. Um, okay. About about noon, it looked like, it looked like about 1.6. We should be getting that on at least, you know, on a, da on a daily basis, if not a couple of times per day. It's just, it's hard to, you know, everybody's going in all different directions right now. Um, hopefully we get down to a thing where we can report things routinely and everybody share that information with everybody. And just so I understand, even though the ditch is still being cleared, is that discharge currently going down yes. the ditch? Okay, yes. so that's, yeah. that's where the, the water is. The, okay. siphon, the siphon's still running. It's it's just that it was it was uh, breaching the banks and and flooding their you know the port stormwater pond um, because of all the blockage in there. And then hopefully hopefully the ditch they said it take about two days. Hopefully the ditch will be cleared by today. Uh, then the decision can be made whether it can handle. Uh, additional discharge. Plus, there was also some, some um, mangrove areas to the south of that ditch that needed to be um, um, some silk curtains and so forth set up. And I believe that was done yesterday. So, Rob, okay. are they, no, sorry, Rob, are they treating any of this water? I mean, historically, they treated this with a double line process. Are they are they bypassing all of it? Sorry, there is no double line process no, there anymore. Not doing that anymore there is no there is no treatment process there other than the no the double line went away you know years ago so there is because because they went to zero discharge double line went away so there is there is no treatment this is raw um very high ammonia um you know i don't even you know we can we can we can estimate i'm i don't want to be the one to tell you what the load is going to be at, it'll it'll have to come from them or DEP, but it's high. And has there been any further thought to drilling a UIC well here, a class one well? 
That's that 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 was the county's recommendation to FDEP. But again, you know, putting in a UIC well to to get the permit and everything else is about two year, two year process percent. anyway. Certainly one of the size. Right. I mean, we were Charles and I were heavily involved in pushing the UIC idea. I think in 2005 after the 04 hurricanes. Yes. Yes, it's. It's, you know, it's it's been all over the board for for many years, and you know, it's it's a shame that we ended up here, with, you know, so close to the finish line. But you know, but again, my concern is that you know the stability of the South Deck forever being used again. I mean, this is this is a second release in ten years. It seems like a run on ten year cycles. Uh, so if it's incapable of being used, um, what do we do with the North Stack as we go into the rainy season? Rob, you, you said the North Stacks now, the water quality is not sufficient for Mantee County to take that at this point. Uh, that That's being evaluated now, but the amount of water that, you know, from the tow drains that, that have been sent up to that North Stack probably, you know, is going to make it impossible for us to treat any. And it's full. It's at capacity now. And with the, the initial releases, there's no indication yet that they've drawn it down enough to identify the problem. I haven't spoken to them today. Again, you know, um, hey, mining folks who maybe help out here but before you you know you could see some surface movement and uh last time and it, it's not really scientific you can put buoys out there and see where, where the current's drawing and this that and the other but right you know the initial the initial part was just to get the infrastructure together to get the release started now hopefully they're moving on to trying to find find the you know the breach as soon as possible Do we have a feel for the drawdown rate at 11,000 gallons a minute? I mean, 15 million a day or whatever that number comes comes up to. Like I said, that's that's the only thing we have is the, you know, is the capacity of those siphons, which are, I mean, that's 11,000 11, a minute. That's it. You know, that's what we've got. So if, again, this is, just me hearing secondhand sort of this information and and doing back of the envelope calculations, but it sounded to me it would be like a 20 day two day process to if they had to completely drain that cell cell, it would probably take about 22 days. That's about 480 both, million both, gallons. Both of them are running efficient, you know, full up. It'd be 22 days to drain the entire stack. Rob, what's the uh, the depth of the pond? Excuse me. Do you, do you know the depth of the pond? Like how much? I think the uh, you know I think it's about twenty feet. Twenty feet. Um, okay. Yeah, I think it's about twenty feet. A lot of surface area. And Rob, one more quick question, Rob. Do we know if it's TKN or is the TKN primarily ammonia or and what ammonia. Is, is just ammonia? And what is the ballpark on that number? How hot is it? Do you have a ballpark on it? Two to three hundred part per million. I think uh, from the estuary point program's perspective, and, and this is what we've been in communication with Rob about, is that potential big load going into lower Tampa Bay initially in this spring, early summer period um, you know, at the start of a growing season. And what that could mean long term for the ecology of the lower part of the bay with that amount of, of nutrient load going potentially going in the bay if, if they have to drain a significant amount of water from the site.
No, um, well, we're planning on having some additional discussions this afternoon with uh, DUP officials, and we'll probably have a, a little bit better insight on a coordinated monitoring approach. But I appreciate everybody's efforts, and you, you've heard a lot from me the past couple of days, and I'm kind of supporting and assisting as much as possible uh, in the response of this discharge. And you know, I really appreciate the community effort in in responding to this. Um, it's a, another in, unfortunate event for the site, but uh, I think the important thing is understanding what the potential short-term and long-term ramifications might be for the Bay's ecology and, and some significant resources in and around the Port Manti site. Anybody have any other questions or comments? Hey, uh, this is Tim McDonald. Um, I just I, I know that you all realize this, but this is this is probably a long term impact that we're looking at as opposed to a short term impact. And I think DEP needs to be aware of that. I'm not sure they think it is I, I think they see it as a water quality issue that'll go away once they stop discharging that's not what i see here i see this is a huge nitrogen load that's going to stick around for a while and get recycled and that could cause a problem in the lower bay a, a long-term problem that needs to be monitored we saw this in bishop's harbor when we did the piney point discharges earlier they actually had to go out there and harvest the macroalgae because it was overshadowing the seagrasses in bishop's harbor um, I, I, perceive, I, I foresee the same kind of issue here. And I just think we need to be aware it's long-term, not short-term. Yeah, thanks, Tim. I, I appreciate that. And we're, we're, we're looking at it from that perspective as well. And, and again, appreciate everyone's support and potentially assisting in those long-term efforts. I think right now we're we're again focused on assimilating uh, information in and around the site, and we'll be talking about it a, little, a little bit on the uh, the compliance assessment report and seagrass transect um, um, presentation that both Maya and Marcus can give. But Marcus has done a good job of of trying to synthesize the existing water quality information, and we're going to make the seagrass transect information in and around Port Manatee site available to DEP and and the county. Uh, in the response to this event. So that's our focus right now. And then longer term, uh, you know, the estuary program has has supported developing more comprehensive monitoring plan for an event like this. And I think we would want to continue to have those conversations with DEP moving forward. Rob, I appreciate you uh, being point on that and providing that update. I know you know no one really wants to have to talk about this issue again at Piney Point, but we appreciate you giving that pretty comprehensive outlook on where we're at at the site. Sure, it's been a really rough week for for everybody down here, um, but uh, you know I think we're we've been through this before we've been on top of it before you know it's before this is this is a little different even even um the efforts or the the release last time there was some treatment there's no treatment now so you know i expect similar if not more severe response this time so one, but one last question from me before we move off of it is, and this is, you know, through various conversations I've had, is there any other alternative approaches that can be pursued within a timely manner that would not necessarily dictate a discharge to the bay? <laughs> Calling water <laughs> offsite? I, or, or, I, I hopefully...
we would have thought about that, you know. that in the past the the only two options that are being discussed well they have processing facilities um it's just dealing with that volume uh it's come down to the you know the last the, the discussions recently there are really only two options you know high level treatment and surface water discharge or um deep well Th those seem to be the only options that are being discussed at this time yeah, I was talking more in, in terms of dealing with this event. Oh, this event? Yeah. Um, I, I, you know, there's um, not this volume of water at this, you know, this rate. No, I, I, I don't know. I, hopefully the department and, and HRK would have kind of, you, you know, looked at all options before this was this was chosen but again it's the the option of of preventing a catastrophic catastrophic event so well, I think all we can do is keep each other posted and and, and provide updates as we receive them. Um, again, I appreciate your time, Rob, and, and walking us through that. Sure. Thanks, Rob. Yep. Oh, Maya, you're up. Okay, I don't have a formal presentation. I just, um, I shared um, in the agenda a link to the draft uh, annual compliance assessment report. So hopefully uh, you all got an opportunity to review it. We tried to take um, the consortium's guidance in terms of how to um, convey the, the missing data for the months of April and May and how, and how we characterized uh, the results for that year. Um, one thing I will note for you all is that we are still waiting on the official seagrass results from the biennial Southwest Florida Water Management District seagrass mapping effort. So there are um, placeholder uh, in the report right now uh, for those for those values. We do anticipate uh, that we're going to be seeing losses of seagrass um, throughout the bay, but particularly in the old Tampa Bay segment. And so uh, it's currently written to, to capture what, what we expect uh, we might be seeing once those numbers are finalized. So we wanted to make sure we got this report out in front of you all so you could review it and make sure you're comfortable with how, how we characterize water quality results and the compliance assessment for 2020. Um, and at some, we do need to submit this report to um, FDEP and EPA by June of this year. So we have time if there are changes that you'd like to see or if everyone's comfortable with what we've presented today. Uh, what we're seeking is um, your concurrence to submit these, this report to DEP and EPA once we have the final seagrass numbers from the district. Any, any discussion at this point? No, just to follow on to what Maya said, the, uh, the so we have the uh, Seagrass Working Group meeting scheduled for April 16th. So we'll be releasing the preliminary results then, and we should have the final maps ready for public release um, by mid-May. So we're we're pretty close to getting those uh, maps finalized for everyone. Uh I mean, I found the document to be consistent with what we've discussed over the last several meetings. Um, I didn't see anything there that would be of any real concern, but if, any, if, if a lot of folks haven't had the opportunity to look through it yet, then I can understand that as well. Yeah, I think the, the question would be to the group is whether or not um, you're comfortable with the document right now to conditionally approve submittal once we receive the updated seagrass numbers or if you'd like to 
see the full document again at a, at a meeting before the June time period uh, when we ultimately have to submit. Hey, Ed. I'm not very talkative this morning. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Ed. yeah. I was just going to add, I mean, certainly I, I think the report does a good job of addressing or including the, the discussion or things around some of the missing data, but I would personally prefer to see that seagrass information um, before I gave my final okay on it. I, I don't know, maybe we could get a few people to speak up on that, whether they think that's an important component, but I do think that's context I'd like to have as I read through the report. Yeah, no, I appreciate that, Santino, and you know, I don't want to speak for, for Chris before he publishes numbers. We're not expecting good baywide results for seagrass coverage estimates for 2020. And do we have similar reductions across each bay segment or is it dominated by old tampa bay and if it is dominated by old tampa bay is it dominated in areas north of the courtney campbell where we have greater difficulty achieving our clinical numbers yeah jeff i can i can speak to that so yes um the majority of the loss both in terms of acreage and percent change is going to be in old tampa bay um and much of that loss is concentrated in feather sound and mobley bay and and other parts but it's it is focused on all the areas north of the howard franklin um and and maybe um, equally distributed across the courtney campbell causeway but but really around the entire perimeter of old tampa bay primarily from the howard franklin north is where we see the greatest loss um, and also um, expect from a more of an acreage standpoint, Middle Tampa Bay, um, it, not so much as from a percent change, but just because there's so much seagrass in Middle Tampa Bay, um, you know, we're we're going to see some some large losses there as well. Does that help a little, Tina? Or you still just want to wait? Jeff, given that context, I mean, that kind of flips it back to the old Tampa Bay working group, really, because, uh, you know, certainly I haven't been involved directly in those discussions, but right. I, I don't hear anybody jumping forward to make a motion. <laughs> yeah. So, do we have an old Tampa Bay working group scheduled between now and the end of May? It's not on the books as of yet, no. I didn't think so. Well, and uh, and with respect to the seagrass numbers, um, this the meeting on the 16th of April is open to to anyone, I, I believe, right, Ed? I'm I'm not misspeaking there, so correct. Uh, if anybody wants to attend, it's virtual, so you know you're welcome to to attend on that Friday and see the numbers. Hey, Chris, this is Tom Ash. Um, a quick question: Do you have any insight on the the species losses? Is it in that part of the bay, are we talking primarily halogeli? Yeah, I mean, it, yes, um, primarily. There's also some rubia. We don't obviously, since we're mapping via you know aerial imagery, we're we're not able to differentiate species. But I think the overarching uh, pattern that we're seeing in Old Tampa Bay is a shift from seagrass to calorpa proliferans. There's a lot of attached algae in Old Tampa Bay, especially uh, feather sound. And in, in and around the area of Mobley Bay, we, we've seen a lot of clarper proliferans come in, just real thick, um, you know, beds of it, where previously there were seagrass. Yeah, we're, we're trying to understand sort of the, the, the patterns of the species distributions um, from some of our seagrass transect information too. Mar Marcus will speak to that, but of course, as just said, is is sort of the anecdotal observations we've been getting from folks in the field of seeing this shift from fairly, you know, pretty well-established how do we beds, at least from the 2014 through 2016-18 period 
declining and then becoming dominated more by chlorpa. We're trying to understand sort of the, that pattern of, of species change that's occurring primarily in the upper portions of the bay. And Tom, I, I think the seagrass transect data that Marcus is going to talk about is probably a, a better source to answer your question as far as species <clears throat> shifts and species uh, changes. Right. Yeah. And, and what Ed just said is why I asked the question, because historically, EPC has done a lot of those transects, and you can definitely see a cyclical nature to particularly the halidule. I mean, you have transects with 150, 200 meters one year, and then almost nothing the next year, and or it'll go, you know, every other year. So um, while it's concerning, there is, I think, a pattern uh, in that part of the bay that maybe we can get a better handle on. Could you send out the invite to the meeting on the 16th, please? Yes, I will. Thank you. If you go to our main website and scroll down to the bottom, there we have a bunch of calendar events, and I think that's one of the last ones is April 16th on our main website. So, uh, not to put anybody on the spot, but um, you know, we've got four, we have four different municipality slash counties that discharge into this bay segment. I don't think we have, I guess we have a one county industrial discharger, or I don't even think they're discharging anymore. Um, then everything else up here is MS4 atmospheric groundwater. Um, but I don't hear any of you guys talking about concerns associated with moving this forward. I don't, I'm, I understand where Tino's coming from. I'm just not sure you know, unless we're looking to change the narrative that um, Maya and Marcus and Ed put together based on those reductions, um, I'm not sure how it changes what we might do a month from now or a month and a half from now on, on the document that they presented to us. This is Nan Bennett with Oldsmar. I've not read the document in depth, but I, I have been able to scan it. Um, I don't see, and, and I think it's standard that we don't go to loads um, in this document. Have we looked at the loads? Has there been a change in loads from from what we've discharged? Yeah, so right now, um, you know, Tony Janicki and Ray Pribble have been reaching out to y'all to start assimilating the 2020 loading information. Uh, we've assembled loadings for the 17 through 19 period too. So do you have some provisional uh, loading information for all the base segments. Um, broad you know, trends or, or changes, we still need to dig into that loading information, especially for the 2020 period once we have it assembled. That's pretty much the direction that we received from you all is to you know, proactively go down that path so that we can provide that information and uh, you know, change course as needed. Okay. I know they've reached out and they've gotten the data. Um, I just wondered if, if we could explain anything based on loads or, or if loads have been constant and we can't explain it based on that. I, I think we're still a little bit too early to come to any significant conclusion yet. Okay. Thank you. I, I just mentioned, and Chris, please feel free to jump in. Uh, you know, I think you know, throughout the district mapping area, you're going to see some significant changes in seagrass resources and whether that that's attributed to larger or broader climatic patterns that we might have observed over the last couple of years. That's, that's still a question that you know, I think the researchers have in their heads. Um, and as we get this new seagrass coverage map for the entire district, um, we could potentially start looking at that. If, there, if there's these broader regional patterns, you know, beyond you know, discrete loadings that are driving some of these seagrass changes that we're anticipating. Yeah, Ed, that's that's correct. Um, the the decline, general decline in seagrass this this past uh, 2020 effort 
is a regional phenomenon. So it's not limited to Tampa Bay or certain base segments. Obviously, there's a lot of variation in the, you know, in the magnitude and the uh, percent change by base segment across the, the Suncoast region. But um, the general pattern of, of decline is is definitely a regional phenomenon. And, th and there's many issues that that could be driving that. I suspect it's it's multiple causes, and and they're probably, you know. Uh, need to be teased out in each of the estuaries. Any any more discussion? Uh, just one last thing, Jeff. Um, this is Tom again. So your point is that regardless of what Chris's final seagrass data it gets included in the report says the meat and potatoes of the document really isn't going to change between now and and due date is that what i understood i mean yeah i mean but to tino's point and based on what chris's last um information provided you maybe you could craft a narrative a little bit that that the seagrass reductions do appear to be regional and um may not be directly attributable to what we were experiencing in Old Tampa Bay. I don't know if that's a valid point. Um, well part of it's valid because you know based on Chris's preliminary information, it is a regional phenomenal phenomenon. Um possibly attributable to other things, but certainly you have to believe some of it's given the fact that the vast majority of it is north of Howard Franklin slash Courtney Campbell, where we already know we have chlorophyll problems. Uh, I, I start to get uncomfortable trying to push that point too hard. It's still valid, it's regional. But that, yeah, that was sort of where I was coming from, Tom, to let everybody sort of move forward, um, since I'm not sure I see a different outcome once the secret state is in place. I think I think the major dam uh, uh, damage could be to leave it go unsaid about what's happening to seagrasses. Um, that um, I, and I don't disagree with you, Jeff. But just that um, uh, w with the lack of any direction to uh, what the data are are, are telling us, uh, it's just going to lead to lead to a whole range of opinions that people are going to be out there with, and and uh, maybe we could. Um, you know, cut that off at the past by having something more specific about the seagrass responses. Well, we well, do include yeah. a statement in here that acknowledges the the losses that are experiencing throughout the Southwest Florida coast that is in the intro, um, just so you all are aware. It's in there. Yeah. We just don't have the numbers. Right. And we haven't, you know, looked at any potential percentages. That's yeah. not do we think this is Nana, Nana again? Do we think we're going to have the low data by then for this time period that we could say, you know, the one thing we have control over is what we discharge. We don't have control over climate change or mixing and all different things, but could we say that there has or has not been any increase or decrease in load that's been discharged into the old Tampa Bay area? Do we think we'll have that data by the time the reports do? I think the, the data that has been assembled by Janicki's group indicates that we're below the hydrologically normalized load limit for Old Tampa Bay. So there's some other phenomenon that's controlling seagrasses, uh, you know, coverage in that bay segment and whether or not we need to uh, look at a, a better benchmark is sort of the flow that the uh, consortium's framework is operating under. And I think we've had that conversation at the last meeting of whether or not we needed to go there. I think the first step is assimilating the loading information, presenting it as it is, and making the case of whether or not some other benchmark is now needed for that for that uh, base segment to you know, maintain or and or recover those lost seagrasses. And the data gap itself is just a huge issue for this bay segment this time around. It's not good for any of them, but this one, given the months that we were missing, 
potentially hurt a lot. Yeah, I, I didn't think the discussion of that was very strong, you know, about that those are the months that we usually have the lower readings. And then when you average them, we only have the higher readings in the warmer months. It certainly, I think, drove some the estimate for chlorophyll in, in the bay segments, for sure. But you know, significant loss of seagrasses don't help in, in terms of saying that Agreed. that wasn't the primary cause of you know, Agreed. what we're observing. Yeah, but this is Carlos Fry with the city of St. Petersburg, and I, you know, I guess I'm a little bit in the same boat. I, I've got the, uh, was able to upload the uh, or download the article today in, or the paper re review it. So I understand we're not going to change the conclusions or, or it is what it is. But it, it goes back to a little bit about man saying there's a way to wordsmith a little different. But I, I guess at this point I'd say let's get it submitted uh, based on what we have and I'd like to throw it out there as a motion if that's what you want. Carlos, you're putting the motion forward as framed up by the agenda item. There's a motion, there's sort of an emotion set under the agenda item. Can you pull that back up for us, Maya? Marcus, can you do it or do you want me to take the screen back? Okay. So you see the recommended action under there, Carlos? to submit the report to US EPA and FDEP once seagrass numbers are finalized by Swift Mud. Yes, I'd, I'll make that motion. Do we have a second? Yeah, I'll second that motion. This is David Glicksburg with Hillsborough County. All right, um, all in favor? Or any opposed? Or any, yeah, how about any opposed? I'll be better. Thank you, Maya. All right, hearing none, uh, the motion as framed up on the agenda passes. Thank you. So, kind of give an intro. Marcus has been doing really good things in terms of assembling our existing data resources into hopefully user friendly products that you guys can start um, you know, teasing out these patterns that we're talking about in numbers and, and annual estimates and putting it more in to a visually appealing way to understand what's going on in, in some of our base segments. So we have a long-term seagrass transect monitoring data set that was initiated by the city of uh, Tampa's Bay Studies Group that we took over uh, when that, that group was formally retired around 2011, 2012 time period. And since that time, um, We've been trying to work towards uh, putting this information out there uh, to hopefully guide decisions and management of each of the base segments as it relates to seagrass. Um, this is, gives a little bit finer look at the seagrass species distributions in the bay based on a number of, of transects that have been monitored uh, since the mid-1990s. So I think this would be a good complimentary data set to show you all and, and let you know this this tool and uh, resources available for you guys to peruse. Uh, and without further ado, I'll, I'll turn it over to Marcus. He could give you a little bit more details and drill down to the particulars of this online uh, visualization data set. Thanks, Ed. Uh, yeah, so all of the conversations we've been having about seagrass so far today are, are really timely because now we have some some new products that we all can use to dive into the data a little bit more, look into some of these more fine grained questions about you know, what's changing species distribution wise, where are the changes occurring? Um, so that's really what, what these things are, are all about. Um, generally speaking, over the last year, we've been developing these, these open science products around a lot of our, our indicators. Uh, and then in the last couple of months, we've really been diving into the, the transect data as a, a very rich source of information that we really haven't, um, I guess, opened up to its fullest extent uh, to date. And, and this is, these dashboards are an effort to, to try to do that. 
So um, I don't really have a whole lot to talk about. Um, I really just kind of want to do a, a live demo of the dashboard. But uh, generally speaking, I want to just provide an overview of, of these products we've created, um, not just from the dashboard, but we do have some software tools uh, that we've developed that are complementary to that if you want to go that route. Um, throughout this presentation, there's uh, a couple ways that you know I'll, I'll tell about how to actually get your hands on the data, um, whether it just be visually through the dashboard or actually downloading this information. We have a couple of different options for doing that. Uh, and then uh, I guess the cat's out of the bag already about seagrass status and trends. Um, I wanted to hit on some of the, the main points that I think were brought up in the discussion earlier about what we're seeing in, in, in these changes, um, not just baywide, but in how it's manifesting in some of the different uh, parts of the bay and different species and, and what that means. So I'll reiterate some of those points that were already brought up. So as a reminder, everybody, uh, we probably, you know, this is this is common knowledge at this point, but in Tampa Bay, we basically have two primary sources of data for seagrass. Uh, one being the coverage maps provided by the district that, that Chris um, uh, manages there. Uh, and then also the transect data, which is a complementary source of information that uh, the estuary program facilitates, but we work with our partners to actually go out there and, and gather that data. Um, the main difference between the two, of course, is the coverage maps provide an assessment of acreage, uh, but it doesn't provide information about species. And that's where the transect data come in. So these are basically going to be place-based locations where we've gone out and, and collected uh, information along transects uh, at different points along these transects to look at what species are there, what the abundances are, and sort of tracking that information over um, actually about a 25-year period now. Uh, and so there's pros and cons with each data set, but they are kind of complementary to each other in terms of what we can do to assess status and trends of seagrass communities in Tampa Bay. So this is mostly talking about the transect data at this point um, in terms of the open science products that we've developed. Uh, this is a map of where these transects have been collected. So these are fixed locations where they've gone out every year. Our partners have gone out every year to collect this information. So we can do some really cool, you know, time series analysis because we have this data tracked at each point over time. Um, color here shows just the, the responsible agency that collects the information. So there's maybe about half a dozen, maybe uh, a dozen uh, agencies that, that we work with to collect this data. Um, so this is uh, this information is available on the dashboard. This is actually a snippet of, of one of the maps that's on the dashboard. You can look at and you know look at um, the name of the transect, the responsible agency, um, Latin law, and all that fun stuff. So if you want to get access to this, um, you know not just the software we've developed to get this information, but also as an entry point for the dashboard. On our new website uh, that we unveiled last year, we have, um, you've probably seen it, there's, there's a data visualization section with multiple cards speaking to different topical components of our reporting products. But now we have a um, uh, Seagrass Transect card on there now that if you were to click on this, this would be your landing page you go to that is kind of gonna be your one-stop shop for um, just getting a broad overview of, of what we're trying to do with these data products, but also links to uh, the dashboard, um, some information about the software packages that we've used to compile this information, and then some, I guess, um, seminal documents that we have here that, that have guided the development of these products historically, um, in addition to many of the other reporting or uh, publications we have out there. So you can go there to access this information, um, but I just want to put in a few uh, points about the software packages that, that we've developed to do this. So I, I, this is more of a technical product here, but something that we think is going to be useful for uh, individuals to actually do these analyses on their own. That's kind of the broader goal of this, this open science objective that we have here at the program. Um, so this software is something that we've developed to basically pull in partner data uh, from multiple sources for multiple different needs. So it's this is going to be our, our catch-all tool that we've used to create our water quality report card, our tidal creek assessment, our, our fisheries indices, our benthic indices. And now uh, with the addition of the transect data, now there's tools in here to work with the, um, uh, the seagrass data from that source. So, this software has functions to pull in the data, analyze the data, and plot the data. Um, it's available for anybody to use. We use it mostly internally, but 
again with this open science ethos we put it out there in the cloud on github for anybody to download and use this on their own and the dashboard um, the reason i'm telling you uh, about this software now is that the dashboard is powered by all the functions in this software so if you want to go that extra mile and actually use the software on your own to do this uh, get those plots on your own computer you can do this and i just have a few slides showing you kind of how easily it is to get this information and so this is this is a bit of our code which is the software we use to to do this uh, with really basically two lines of code you can import all of the transect data that we have available so again 25 years of data covering about 70 uh, almost 70 transects across the bay um, so this pulls in data from the water atlas where this is stored um, as you can see it's over 130,000 records so a very rich source of information um, we have functions to summarize this information even more so this is basically just showing you how we're taking that raw data and then summarizing estimates of essentially frequency occurrence and abundance summarized to species at each transect and at, e at each date where we've got this information and then of course we have uh, plotting functions and this is where the rubber hits the road in terms of getting a sense of what these trends are at these individual transects so this is showing you um, a time series of different species abundances at the s1 t16 transect which is in between the uh, Courtney Campbell and Howard Franklin bridge I believe um, so just south of Feather Sound um, but what you see here is essentially all of the uh, you know, the 20 years of data we have for this transect from uh, the oldest data on the bottom to the most recent uh, last year's data on the top, and then um, the distance along the transect on the bottom from, or uh, on the x-axis from basically shoreline to the, the seagrass edge. And so um, each point shows the uh, abundance of the different species and where they occurred. Uh, and so you can get a sense of um, not just where they they're showing up in the transect but how those species abundances have changed over time so this is actually potentially a really valuable tool for understanding um, historical changes in as we've talked about earlier uh, recent changes at these individual transects uh, it's all interactive so you see when i mouse over these points you can get information about the species the year where it was in the transect the abundances and all that um, you can subset different things. Um, this is getting into some of the interactivity that we'll get on the dashboard, but we really try to make these things um, not just static, but really dynamic in terms of how you can engage with the information. Uh, this is another function that shows data results at the transect level. So this is for that same transect, but now kind of averaged across sampling points along the transect. So we get a more condensed summary of how frequency occurrence has changed over time at this location um, using this transect as an example so you can see that basically how the dually is the dominant one um, that's that's very common but you can see how these these frequency occurrences have changed over time um, you know generally increasing over time but the allocation of that frequency has varied depending on what species you're looking at and then we have functions for looking at um, bay-wide summaries. So the, the last few functions I showed you were looking at the individual transects, but obviously we want to kind of make conclusions about how seagrass is doing uh, at the bay-wide level or individual segments within the bay. So we have a function that essentially condenses all of this information even more. So uh, here we're looking at uh, changes in the frequency occurrence of individual species over time for the entire bay. Uh, so you can see generally that we have the total on the top. So frequency occurrence increases, that's great. Uh, you can see how it varies by species. But again, this is just giving you that broad picture of what's going on with these individual species. And I'll show you on the dashboard, but the way this is set up is this function will let you look at either all of the segments or any of the segments of your choosing so you can say maybe i want to just look at old tampa bay and you could use this function to look at how um, the frequency occurrence, occurrence estimates have changed only for that segment or maybe you want to look at old tampa bay plus hillsborough bay you can do that so you can mix and match any of these combinations at your will uh, and i'll show you how to do that on the dashboard 
And then because we like report cards, uh, we do have a transect summary report card that kind of looks at um, broad summaries of averages of frequency occurrence, how they changed over time by segment. And so the main difference between you know, this graphic and the previous is also, you know, the presentation and how we're showing the information, but now we've we've combined everything by species and we're showing it at a, a segment wide level. Um, and so you can see that, um, you know, looking at basically from 2019 to 2020, uh, we do see, you know, a bay wide drop in frequency occurrence and also seeing some of those changes at the individual segment level. And so this is again in line with some of the conversations we were having earlier about some of the anticipated changes in seagrass um, uh, with, the, with the release of the data, uh, the coverage maps in, in April or uh, May. Um, another thing to note about this graphic is that usually our report cards follow that, that stoplight color scheme. Um, we opted not to do that for the transect data because we don't really have a good sense of where those those exact breakpoints lie. And we don't want to, you know, add, I guess, value statements implicitly onto these graphics by imposing colors that might not have some sort of ecological interpretation. So we chose a neutral color scheme here. And we actually have, um, this is a continuous color gradient as well as opposed to bins. Uh, again, going back to this idea that we don't necessarily have a good sense of where those breakpoints are in terms of what's what's good or bad uh, frequency occurrence. So we know that generally speaking, higher frequency occurrence is better, but we don't want to make statements where that, you know, what what that line in the sand is for, for basically these, these broad categories. Uh, but this does get you, give you a sense of relative changes, and that's, that's the uh, the whole point there. So I'll go to the dashboard right now, but you can access it here at this website. This is hosted on our, our, our main TBEP website uh, where all of our other Shiny applications live. Um, let me just exit out here and do a quick uh, demo. So this is the landing page. Um, if you've been to some of our other dashboards, it has the same look and feel. You have an overview page that basically explains what the the dashboard is all about and what the tabs do. Uh, but then we kind of go from um, different tabs from left to right, going from pretty much general summaries of, of condition to more specific information, depending on how deep you want to go. So this overall summaries tab is going to be probably, you know, the highest level of information you're going to get. And we have the report card here that I just showed you. Uh, broken out by different segments, and then this this time series of uh, how frequency occurrence has changed for different species over time. And we also have this map uh, that I talked about earlier, showing you where the transects are located and which monitoring agency collects that information. Um, so a lot of the functionality that I just showed you in the slides is the exact same in the dashboard, obviously. But what I do want to do is just kind of show you that you can you know change what years you're looking at, because this is all interactive. Um, you can remove or add different species at your uh, at will here. So that that is, uh, you know, another thing you can do. What I was talking about earlier about just looking at individual base segments. So um, actually, I'm going to do Old Tampa Bay. So I'll remove everything but Old Tampa Bay and look at frequency occurrence of how that's changed and so this you'll see that the summer graphics have changed so now the report card is showing the overall summary uh, as well as uh, just the summary for old tampa bay but now this graphic here on the right is showing frequency occurrence only for old tampa bay so we can get a sense of how the individual species has has kind of changed so um, as we had talked about earlier uh, look like how the has generally been the dominant one in Old Tampa Bay, and that's the one that has taken the biggest hit for the most part. Um, moving on to summaries for individual transects. This is where, again, if you want to go a little bit deeper and look at specific locations as opposed to these, these bay-wide summaries, you can pull up um, individual transects. And so I'll go to, uh, this is the Feather Sound transect. This is a really interesting one. Um, because uh, this is a case where we actually see uh, 
you know, this is sort of the long-term change here. We get Halidouli and Serangodium for the most part historically, but recently, you know, with, with, with uh, 2020 and I guess 2019 and 2018, we've seen this huge uptick in uh, Calerpa, which is an attached algae that, that many people mistake for seagrass, but is not actually seagrass proper. And so we have a lot of general questions about what this means. Like why are we seeing this recent uptick, uh, uptick in Calerpa? Um, you know, why that's happening? And also from a environmental management perspective, you know, what is the, the ecosystem value of Calerpa? Does it provide the same habitat benefit as, as um, you know, submerged species? And, and you know, what, what, are, what are the consequences for seeing that being replaced? And so this is an avenue that's ripe for follow-up work, um, as well as just an interesting phenomenon that, that we should maybe explore further. So I'm just drawing out your attention there. Um, you know, so you can look at any of these other uh, transects, um, you know, uh, based on, on map selection here. And then the last two tabs, um, I have uh, a tab here looking at tracking how the seagrass edge, so the maximum depth that it's been growing at these individual transects. Um, I have a way for tracking that here. This is kind of experimental, but um, something that perhaps could be useful as kind of an early warning indicator, because oftentimes you see changes in how deep the seagrasses are growing as, as your first indication of, of uh, changes in water quality that could be affecting seagrass growth patterns. So I wanted to include this on here as an alternative line of evidence for tracking uh, status and trends of seagrasses at these locations. And then of course, uh, data downloads. Um, I have a couple ways you could do it. Uh, as I said before, you can you can access the data using the software package, but I realize not everybody's going to want to do that. So you can get it from the dashboard. Um, I have a couple options. One getting the entire transect data set. So all of the data broken down by date and transect and by individual basically quadrats or sites along each transect. So this is gonna be those about 130,000 records or so if you wanna get that. And it's actually not a very large file and it takes about a couple seconds to get if you hit that download button. Uh, if you want summaries by frequency occurrence, so essentially transect and date, but broken down by species, you can go to this tab here and uh, download this, this table to get an estimate of frequency occurrence for each species, as well as an average abundance uh, based on the Braun Blanquet estimates for, for abundance. Uh, we also have transect locations if you want a table of lat long for, for GIS, for example. And then of course, metadata describing um, each of these tabs, what, what the, uh, the columns are that you're, you're gonna uh, download from these data sets. So this is, um, that's the dashboard and this is a pretty new product we've put out there. You know, I welcome any feedback you all have about, um, you know, whether or not this is useful, any features you would like to see or if things are broken that, that, that shouldn't be broken, feel free to get in touch. I always encourage you guys to, to um, let me know if this is a useful product because without your feedback i don't know if what we're doing is is, is addressing your needs so uh, always get in touch if you want to um, give me your thoughts on that uh, the last thing i'll say is um, i just again want to reiterate on some of these recent trends that we're seeing um, things we've already been discussing but i think they're worth reiterating just to you know prime us for for what to think about moving forward um, as I showed here, you know, we do see this reduction in frequency occurrence, particularly from the 2019-2020 uh, uh, change. And I think that kind of mirrors what we're expecting to see in the coverage maps. And so when those come out, we we'll wanna compare the transect data with the coverage maps to, to make sure that we're getting the most out of both of these data sets. Uh, and this, this interesting uptick, uptick in Calerpa is something that, that could be an, an interesting research avenue to understand why that's how it's happening and uh, what that means from a from a habitat value perspective. Uh, so we've had those discussions internally as well as with our TAC uh, as terms of a, an avenue for additional research. Um, and also we are anticipating having a coverage dashboard. This is this is a newer product, but um, something that I've been playing around with the last couple of months. Um, and when the the uh, 2020 maps come out, I, I think we're going to try to have this live so you can really do this deeper dive of understanding um, the, the changes that have occurred at the acreage scale. And what I think is really cool about this is 
Um, I'm trying to make this accessible to the point where you can actually draw individual polygons over areas of interest. And so this is the feather sound uh, area right here. And so I, I want to provide this functionality so you can look at areas you might care about. But when you when you draw these polygons, you'll get this really detailed um, assessment of what has happened between different year pairs. And so right here, I'm showing you um, 2001 compared to the, the most recent year of available data, 2018. And you can see how um, the, the acreage has changed, um, not just quantitatively, but where uh, the different acreage values have gone from, you know, continuous to patchy or continuous to sand and that sort of thing. And this will give you that, that high level look at that to more do this, this uh, diagnosis. So look forward to that. I need to do some more development on it to make sure it's working as I, as I plan, but this is going to be a complimentary product that I think will, will, will complement the uh, transect data quite well. So that's pretty much it. Um, those are my goals, and these are all links to the resources um, to get to this information. Um, I think the um, this uh, presentation is linked in the meeting materials for today, so you can get to it there. But um, again, I'm open to feedback on this, and if there are any questions at this point, I'd be happy to take some. So far, it's only compliments in the chat, Marcus. I like compliments, but I want to I want to discuss these things too. So feel free to ask questions about it. So we're making the rounds on these products. Um, we talked to the TAC about this and we're talking to the uh, Southwest Florida Seagrass Working Group uh, next week or so as well. So we're, we're making these products well known. Um, again, open to any feedback you guys have. Um, so just, just get in touch. I also did throw another link in the chat to another product that Marcus had developed, taking the, the loading estimates that the Janicki gets from you all and visualizes them. Um, so it's he's putting together a lot of really helpful stuff and we'll keep trying to feed it your way. I know that even, even the, the dashboards can be a little overwhelming before you get a chance to play with them, but it's I I'm I'm really appreciating it. So Marcus, I had a, a question, uh, and you and I, I think, have talked about this before, but is there, uh, have you looked at taking the water quality um, dashboard and the tools that you've developed for water quality and merging that with both the transect and, and the coverage tools that you have to, to start to see if we can draw some correlations between water quality and, and seagrass distribution? <laughs> Yeah, that's that's kind of the holy grail of all this. Um, I mean, it, it's easy to ask that question, and it's more difficult to answer because these these are data sources coming from many many different places. Uh, and so, if I mean, the way I've been de developing these dashboards has been pretty modular at this point. Um, that's not to say that that the data couldn't be combined in some way. Um, the the best example we have so far is the water quality dashboard combines the water quality data with the, the phytoplankton data as two separate but complementary data sets. And, and that functionality is cool because you can click at one station, one EPC monitoring station, and look at both water quality and, and phytoplankton cell abundance to make conclusions about how those two things are correlated. I think it'd be super cool to do something similar with the seagrasses, but that brings into um other questions about how do you combine these things in space and time um not you know insurmountable challenges but but you know from a data analysis perspective um those are things that i need to figure out uh and you know an idea i did have you know is this given these recent changes we are seeing um in tampa bay as well as as you alluded to chris at, at, at um, a more regional level i think it's important for us to think about how to do these these correlational analyses to, to really get a handle at, at what's potentially driving these changes or what's not to rule some things out. And we do have a wealth of data available to us in Tampa Bay to, to, to begin to answer those questions. Whether or not that fits in a dashboard is a bigger question versus you know whether this is sort of an academic exercise. 
I'm not really sure at this point, but I think it'd be really cool to have a dashboard that combines all of these things, but my head kind of hurts just thinking about how that, that would work. Uh, but nonetheless, it, it's something to work towards in the future for sure. And I, I think Marcus too, what, what's really cool about those, those tools that you've created is the interactive nature of how you can do things like, I want to look at 2001 and 2020 or 18, you know, and you can just slide something and then all of a sudden there it is you have that data comparison and I, I think where one thing that really stood out i really like those plots that you have of the depth distribution of seagrass for, for transect because it'd be really cool to take the light attenuation data and somehow overlay that with the the deepest extent where we see not only where we see presence absence but the type of seagrass or if we're seeing chlorophyll because we know uh you know attached to algae has lower light requirements than seagrass, it grows a lot deeper. So is that is that shift from more holoduly to calorpa proliferans a function of light availability? And I think that tool that, that you've set up, potentially we can start testing that. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot we can do with the transect data and, and the dashboard is just the tip of the iceberg. I mean, it's it's literally just showing you essentially the data as is. It's not doing really any formal analysis at this point. And something I've wanted to do for a while, in addition to just this broader synthesis of multiple data sets, is, is look at, at the maximum edge. And that's why I had that in there. Um, there's ways we can do that with the transect data quite literally. Uh, there's also ways we can do it with the coverage maps by overlaying that information on, on the bathymetry. Uh, and there's there's a lot of avenues um, and it's just how we want to do it and, and, and at what time scale. And again, with, with these recent changes, um, you know, I think those questions are going to become more and more pressing and uh, how we can use the existing data to, to further address those and, and get a better understanding of what these changes are, how they're happening, what's driving them. So you and I, Chris, should talk offline about how to do this because I, you have some ideas, I have some ideas, and I think there's the, there, the data we have are just ripe for, for a deeper dive. Well, one, my one last comment is I, I appreciate, you know, all the effort that you've put into this. And, and I know that, you know, we've, we've used your um, Transect dashboard to, you know, to help us it, you know, um, it enhance or add value to, you know, our field verification that we do for our seagrass maps. So it's a great cross check to make sure, you know, the patterns that we're seeing in our maps are, are consistent with what we're seeing in the transect. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, hey, I'm just taking data that other people got, um, you know, so a huge, uh, Thank you to all of our partners that get this information. I mean, we just coordinate. I mean, Gary coordinates, does a great job, you know, doing the field training every year to make sure everyone's using the same approach to get the information. Uh, but really, we just were the benefit of all that work. Um, we get the data and then we synthesize it. So it's a, it's a team effort. And without that, we wouldn't have been able to put out these great products. Don't, don't underestimate that part though, Marcus, because I know from, from listening to you, tidying the data is, is usually the most, uh, Next to going out to collecting it, tidying up your data is, is a huge, heavy lift, and you've made it a lot easier. Well, I mean, yeah, I appreciate that, Chris, but I can sit here and drink my coffee and do that and stay, you know, nice and warm in the house while everyone else gets cold in the water in the mud. So, different strokes, man. <laughs> indeed, indeed, that's right. Well, those are all the official topics that we had for today. We got a little space for open discussion and we do need to set next meeting dates. Yep. Great, great product, Marcus. Um, I do want to sort of circle back around to the rulemaking and legislative stuff and just, I really cannot stress enough to start your conceptual plan that that uh, reclaim water bill will pass. There will be a November 1st deadline in my expectation for the conceptual plan. Now, how long it takes DEP to review all those plans is another question entirely. Uh, they certainly don't have any economists on staff. They will have to outsource any kind of economic evaluation. I've already heard that all the way from, from several layers, um, Truett as well as uh, Weinstein. Um, but 
make no mistake, it is passing. It went unopposed. It didn't even go through. It didn't even go through the normal committee process on the Senate side. It is going. So um, start thinking about what that means to you. Um, and I, I would start looking at what what your op opportunities are. They're different depending on where you are located in our watershed. Um, I think there's a man to you know to your concern about the asset management. I think there's a fair amount of time sitting out there with that. Again, it, the plan is going to be firm, but the reporting period and coming up to speed that reporting period would be a component of your plan if you don't already have an asset management system in some way, shape, or form in place. When I look at the asset management stuff, my bigger concern is the timelines for inspection of your entire system and that recurring inspection and what even constitutes an inspection. Most of us have thousands of miles of pipe in the ground. Um, the idea that we're going to do that once every five years could be burdensome and, and, and more importantly, why would we do that on a neighborhood that was installed a year ago or five years ago when it might have a life expectancy of 50 years? So I think those are more outstanding questions that you want to make sure you wrap into your plan. And any other open discussion on that or other things? Um, and, and like David said, I'm representative of the Utility Council for Wastewater. I'm also tied into the drinking water side. Um, if you've got any questions, I'm, I'm pretty embedded in the rulemaking as well as the legislation that's being forwarded right now. Hey, this is Rob. Just a quick update. I just got off the phone with Jeff. The SMH, what's been released so far, about 25 million gallons. Rob, did he say both siphons are operational now? No, just the one because they're still cleaning out the ditch. But okay. he did say that, that the secretary was at the site this morning. So we'll probably get an update from him at uh, the one o'clock meeting. Gotcha. Thanks, Ron. So Ed, what do you want to do for a next meeting? We The, the dates that I had proposed were sort of, you know, in case we needed to meet before submitting the report. Um, so there's those dates or we could consider other ones. I'm looking at the calendar now. Um, I think we're anticipating hearing back something potentially on a grant we submitted last fall by mid to late summer, I'm hoping. So I think end of May, early June, might be a good time period uh, unless folks want to meet sooner than that you know we have a couple of different issues we're dealing with right now in terms of old tampa bay and piney point if there's a desire to meet um, before the end of may then please speak up and if the uh, i'm sorry my if if the you know if the consortium wants me to present the uh the 2020 results to um you know happy to do that at the next meeting, whenever that may be. Would the week of May 24th work for most? So I have the 25th, the 26th, or the 28th as options. Probably not the 28th for me. Twenty sixth and twenty seventh would be good for me, Ed. Would also prefer avoiding Friday. It's like if it was the 27th, it would have to be an afternoon meeting potentially that worked for 
folks. Yeah. 26. Does that work for you? That's, that's, that's what I'm looking. Yeah. That was the one date I had that week that didn't work, so I'm checking. Oh, I, hey, thought, uh, I thought you had 27th on there. Well, no. about the, I, the morning of the 26th then. Yeah. Ed, Ed this is Urban Ketty with Largo. On the yeah. on that Thursday, that, that Thursday that week, uh, Pinellas County uh, uh, Stormwater yeah. Wastewater Partnership has a, a meeting, a conflicting meeting, and uh, a lot of the players that are here um, are participate in that meeting as well. So that yeah. that was that my point. yeah. That I, I apologize. That was a that was a bad date to throw out there. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> This, I was just going to say um, the HAB symposium, the National HAB symposium was that week, so there might be a conflict um, for HAB people, but we don't have the schedule yet. So. We want to shoot for the morning of the 26th. Does that work? Yes. Hearing no objections. <laughs> okay. May 26, 9.30 a.m. So we're gonna, do we have a motion to, if there's nothing else, do we have a motion Listen to- Send a follow up to this meeting. Fine. Hearing nothing else, do we have a motion to close the meeting? Hey, Jeff, <clears throat> before we do, just one, one second, if I may. Um, I'll be uh, retiring on May the 7th. So this is my last meeting uh, that I'll be attending for the city. Just want to thank everyone um, that I've worked with on this group these past 10 years and wish you all the very best. So again, thank you. Thank you, David. We appreciate it. Yep. Yep. Good luck. Definitely appreciate all your input and insights for sure. You're, I'm hoping you're you're sticking around in the region and can contribute as a, a private citizen in some way. That's correct. Very good. I've already warned the political bodies that they think they had crazy stuff. <laughs> 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 Again, thanks everybody. Thank you, Doug. Anything else? Can I have a motion to close the meeting? So moved. A second? I know no one's not in favor. So. Second. <laughs> Second. Sorry, I was on mute. <laughs> um, all right, hearing no opposition to that, I hope everybody has a great rest of the day and uh, a wonderful weekend. Thank you all.